And it's great to hear, and it's, it gives all of us that have, doesn't have kids yet a little bit of hopes. <laughs> is there a good moment to have children, or just never a good moment to have children, or it's always a good moment to have children? If biology didn't interfere, I would say when you're retired. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I had a secret plan that to propose to the government that was like, you have your child when you are like 20 or 25, so you are like perfectly biological and you give it to your parents and your parents take care of it. So it's always like one generation postponed because in this way you are like more stable economically and mature and everything. So that could work. You actually raised your grandchildren. That would be like creating a secret. Today we have with us two guests that are coming to talk about parenthood in academia. The first of them is Michelle Olsen, that I really want to thank her for being here with us today. Michelle is a full professor of neuroscience in, at Virginia Tech. Uh, she's a superwoman. She is able to do so many things, including running marathons. But the most amazing thing for me is that she is able to do this, to do her amazing science in astrocytes, the best cells in the, in the brain, according to me. But at the same time, she's mother of four children. And the biggest challenge is that three of them were born at the same time. So we have she has triplets and she also has another kid that was born before. So thank you very much, Michelle, for being here with us today. And the second guest that we have here is Ivan Sweetheck. So Ivan is a grad student at Virginia Tech in the TBMH program. She works at Robo Lab and he is in the fourth year of his PhD. And he has a beautiful daughter that is um, Olive and he is the primary caregiver of her. And he has to make compatible his research with taking care of his child. So thank you very much, Ivan, for being here. We're very excited about this topic. It was suggested by many people that were in my room, but at the beginning, we didn't know very well how to frame it and how to bring up the topic, mainly because we didn't have people experienced enough on the topic. That is like part of the academia to be able to speak about it. But we realized that the um, academia for a long time has not been a family-friendly place. And it's something that, in our opinion, has to change. And I like to think about the people in this community as people that really want to promote this change in academia that is needed in many aspects. Uh, and that's why we decided to host it. But we needed to invite people. And that is why I'm so thankful to Michelle and to Ivan that I have the pleasure to uh, know personally for joining us today here. And there are two people that I admire a lot, uh, scientifically, but also personally. And, and they have like amazing stories about their lives. Michelle is a professor at Virginia Tech and she's a super expert in astrocytes that you all know now that is my favorite cell type in the world. Uh, but what many people don't know about her, that it's like more personal, and I'm going to say it, I hope she's fine with her, is that she has four kids, three triplets, and, <laughs> and another kids, and, and she's still a super successful woman that is very engaged in every activity that we started in the School of Neuroscience. So I think that she's a great example, a role model for all the women that we are in the School of Neuroscience. And I wanted to share her with the world and share her with all of you and talk about her experience and her challenges that she probably has faced during all this time. And I also wanted to invite Ivan. So Ivan is a super, par a super father, super parent, and he's a guy student in my lab. So we work together and he has a, a, a kid, Olive. She's now three and a half, if I'm not wrong. Am I right? Yeah. Uh, that is like a crazy kid. I love her. She's like so smart and <laughs> everything. But what I really um, appreciate is how Ivan is engaged with taking care of the kids because uh, many times when we talk about parenthood, we talk about how moms are facing challenges. But obviously this has to be a two people work and it has to be split and you and we expect also men being engaged of the task. And Ivan represents exactly that role of really being part of uh, his child in all the aspects and facing challenges that are the rest of that, about schedules, about planning, and 
when you have a pandemic, even worse, I guess. So that's also why I decided to not only have women talking about this, but also inviting a man and talking about how this is everyone's job and how we have to create a culture to make easier for parents to be able to stay in academia because we don't want to lose their talent. So that is why we decided to start with the session and we have like an outline of things that we would like to discuss and that has been posted by Carmen there, but I can share it again because I know that Matt just joined. So I'm going to share it again and you can follow what we are discussing. So how we want to do this a bit, because not all of us are as experienced, is we're going to start with the questions and we're going to give the invited speakers, oh, speakers like guests, because it's our guests, it's our home, it's our family, to talk about, about them and how they face and how they overcame the problems related to those. And we are all invited to join and start to, to speak. But even uh, the most important part is now you, if you have questions about the topic, you have here people to help you and to discuss about them with much more expertise on the field. Than we do. <laughs> so before starting, I don't know if Michelle or Ivan want to say something and share something like about themselves uh, that is not in my presentation. <laughs> You're welcome to do it. Um, about myself? Uh, yeah, when we get into the topics, uh, I have some things to say, I guess. I don't really know that much about how productivity decreases after a child, because I was lucky enough to have my child born exactly when I started graduate school, so it's great timing. Uh, well, actually, I, when I was getting my master's degree, I could say that things were a lot easier for, for me particularly, because I'm kind of like a night owl, so I would just kind of like to grind out my stuff all night and then wake up in the middle of the afternoon if I needed to. And uh, things change a lot when you have a more rigorous schedule based on an outside person. So I don't think it has to decrease necessarily, but you definitely don't, if you haven't built up a skill set that works around having a normal regular schedule like that, then you're going to need to change. That's all. <laughs> Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, as Carmen uh, said, my name is Michelle. It's great to be here. And it's great to talk about kids and being a scientist, because I think the two things actually go together well. I mean, at least I've managed it. And I have a lot of colleagues, both male and female, who are managing it as well. So as Carmen indicated, I have four kids. Um, and kind of just to give you the timeline of that. So, you know, maybe you can ask questions as we move on regarding the conversation. So, with my first baby, I um, got pregnant when I was a graduate student and um, was six months pregnant when I defended. So I, you know, I graduated with without having a baby, but I was pregnant at the time with my PhD. Um, and then I um, became tri pregnant with triplets when I was a postdoc, um, probably in the second or third year of my postdoc. So when I started my faculty position, I had a four month old and, and three 10 month old babies. And, <clears throat> you know, I think you always can deal with what's put in your plate. And, you know, I was really excited to be a scientist. I love having a big family. And I think I do, I mean, obviously it's challenging. Having kids in general is challenging. But I think that's true regardless of what you're doing for a living. I think being in academia, maybe there are some different challenges. But I totally think that you can be a parent and be a good active parent in academia and manage both a laboratory and your family's lives. It's not to say that it's not complicated, um, but it's totally, I mean, it's manageable for sure. And it's great to hear and it, it gives all of us that ha doesn't have kids yet a little bit of hopes. <laughs> I also want kids. So um, it's great to hear these words of encouragement. I think I'm speaking for many people here. Um, and also regarding what Ivan said, um, regarding the timing uh, of, of when having kids. So that is the first topic that we wanted to discuss. Is there a good moment to have kids? This is like a little bit of a challenging question, I guess, a provocative question. So is there a good moment to have children or there's never a good moment to have children or it's always a good moment to have children? What do you think about that? If biology didn't interfere, I would say when you're retired. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I had a secret plan that to propose to the government that was like, you have your child when you're like 20 or 25. So you are like 
perfectly biological and you give it to your parents and your parents take care of it. So it's always like one generation postponed because in this way you're like more stable economically and mature and everything. So that could work. You actually raised your grandchildren. That would be like the ideal situation for nowadays. We're practicing that in Appalachia right now, but it's unfortunately due to our terrible addictions. Yeah. So Ivan, what do you want to, to, to share about that? The first question then, what do you think? What is a good moment to have children? Oh, I'd say probably not right when you start your graduate career, but uh, maybe a little bit later. Um, give yourself a, a heads up of a couple of years. But um, I don't know. I think it depends on your situation, too. It depends on how you're doing it with a, or what your situation is with your partner as well. Like, I think if, you, if you're the person with more flexibility in your time or your partner has more flexibility then it makes less of a difference when you do and also i guess it depends on if you're a man or a woman probably makes some impact on this but i don't know when no i would say it's always going to be a bad time to have children so you may as well just pick the least bad time for yourself right <laughs> they're never going to be convenient or like a big productivity booster at first. So I think you may as well just bite the bullet when you feel right for yourself personally, probably. It would make sense for yourself and your partner or just have it on accident and see what happens. I don't advise that I did it. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> it's not something advised, honestly, because later finally you can have a child in the middle of the pandemic that is not fine either. But yeah, I well, can talk about myself later though. I would have to predict. <laughs> <laughs> so, Michelle, what do you think about this particular topic? So, this is a really interesting question. I, I mean, obviously, I think choosing the time to have a baby is totally dependent on your family situation. And work is one of those things that I think you should consider when you decide that it's time to have a family. But really, I don't think work and what you're doing at work, um, like, when, when I, you know, when I had my, when I had got pregnant with my first child, we were actively trying to have children. And when I got pregnant with my second child, we were actively trying to have children, right? And, and if I wouldn't have had my second babies, you know, when I was a postdoc, I would have tried right after I started my lab because my husband and I wanted a family. And um, I, I feel like it's really a really personal decision and, you know, I agree with Ivan. I think probably the most challenging time might be at the start of graduate school. And most graduate students are relatively young there. So at the very start of graduate school, that might be a challenging time as you're kind of entering into academia. But I feel like after that, I mean, obviously, um, everything comes into play, whether you're going to be moving, um, whether you're going to be changing locations, whether you're switching from one position to another. But again, I really feel like if you and your family, your partner or whatever, have made the decision to have a baby, you're going to find a way to make it work, right? And so I feel like, you know, again, I know I keep saying this, but I feel like it's a really personal decision. When you and your husband, spouse, wife, whatever, decide that you want to try to have a baby, um, I think that's, honestly, that's the right time. Whenever it works for you and your family. And sometimes you're surprised. And you're like, okay, I'm going to make this work, right? So I think all, you know, late in graduate school is good, right? As you're getting ready to graduate. For me, having new kids right when I started my own lab, the nice thing about once you start your own lab is that you have a lot of independence. You're not accountable to really anyone other than making your lab succeed. No one's paying attention to your schedule. As long as you're getting your work done, doing it, you know, um, when you're starting your lab is, all, is also a time that worked out well for me. Yeah, I, I think that you are making a very great point here that it's like when we say that academia is not friendly for families, we forget many times some of the advantages that we actually have as scientists. That is our flexibility to do our work, like how much freedom we have many times. And I think that that's a very important point. So what I had to say, it's regarding what Ivan was discussing about being a graduate student and, and being a, a parent. I was very surprised when I discovered that in some places in Europe, especially in Northern Europe, uh, it's apparently pretty common to have children in the last years of, the, of graduate school. 
but it is also because you are well protected by your contract that you have as a student, let's say, because I think that that's also something to keep in mind when you're in countries like the United States, that it's how, uh, if you are going to have parental leave or paid parental leave or not, if you're going to have uh, any kind of assistance from your institution later to raise your kid or not. And I think that those things would make easier for people to have kids when they're in academia, but obviously you cannot fully Re depend on those things you need to figure out other ways if you really want to make it i guess yeah i think we could say is it easier or hard to have kids in academia but i think it almost depends more on is it easier or hard to have kids in whatever society you're in like one with a strong like in some parts of scandinavia they send you a box with all the stuff in it that sounds nice in america they don't do that <laughs> yeah but in america you don't do that because America doesn't depend that much on the state in the sense in the government, let's say. But what you have is like more social uh, help in the sense for so you have this thing that is the baby shower that doesn't exist in my country. I mean, that the is- The baby that shower, is you'd be surprised it's only useful really for that one day. And then after that, it's, it's not uh, a big source of support. <laughs> We, we were discussing about baby shower, Carmen and I, we were discussing about the fact that it's super weird for, for us European to celebrate before the baby is born. Yeah. And it's something that really I cannot get. <laughs> so that is something really it's cool. Great. It's a great opportunity to stock up on things that you need that yeah. you know, other people purchase for you. I think it's like, it's like a big party, right? And if you have alcohol, maybe the mother's not drinking, yeah. but everyone else is having cocktails and good food. I, th and I think, yeah. Having, it's having, like having, having celebration. <laughs> yeah, we have more like a party after the baby's born. Yeah, we do the that, same, but after, yeah. We say yeah. you don't want, in, in Spanish, we sh you don't want to sell the skin of the bear before you hunt it. That's how I say. So it's something like that. It's like, you don't have the baby yet. So wait a minute until you actually have the baby. But what I'm trying to say is that you have like this thing of people giving you presents to try to help you because you need to purchase a bunch of stuff. That's the idea of the baby shower in my mind. Yeah. So the government is not giving you any stuff, but people are trying to support you to start that part. So it'd be I nice think in to have yeah. more paid leave. I think I think that's really the thing in America is very dependent on what job you have. So I think my wife had like three weeks, and I, I we had my baby slightly before. So my job had nothing. I was just allowed to take some time, like two weeks off. So if you live in a place where they're just like, here's some money to survive the first couple of weeks where you're hallucinating, anyway. That would be nice. So I guess it depends on where you live. That's, that should go into your accounting a little bit or how nervous a person you are anyway. I spent a lot of time staring at my tiny daughter, making sure she was breathing in the middle of the night. So if that's your personality, uh, <laughs> take that into account because you can't see it. I wanted to, I eventually just got like a little glass to make sure she was alive. Uh, she's fogging it up. It's good. But uh <laughs> Okay, does anyone have uh, any question regarding this thing about the timing? Is it really a good time? Anything to discuss about that? Yeah, we have a lot of curious people here. I think they, they want to know <laughs> the opinion of <laughs> more experienced yeah. than foreign. So before moving the topic, I'm going to share something. that This was my husband's uncle, and he told me before we get married, actually. So what he told me is that to do any of those big things in life, like getting married or having kids or all these things you need to be a bit crazy because if you think too much about it you would not do it <laughs> it's like so scary so big and so important that you really need to be a bit crazy and that's fine i mean but if you are a scientist you're almost a bit crazy for, for sure so i don't think it's a big deal from that point of view but i think that that's a very good point it's a bit insane to make these decisions when you have a a life when you are going to move and it's probably less stable at our types of life, but it's also more exciting. So, yeah, it also depends on the baby you get. Probably, I have this new little nephew baby who just sits there like a blob, and I'm so jealous and angry because so my baby was very opinionated from day one, uh, and I didn't realize that not all babies only yell in anger. Some occasionally cry in sadness. That was the funniest thing. Is meeting a baby that cried and just sounded sad because all of my daughter has only ever yelled in anger, never cried in sadness once. So <laughs> yeah, this luck of the draw is involved. 
Yeah, definitely. You need to be very lucky. I have my hypothesis because my sister just had a baby and I had a baby and they are both super, super good babies. And we are saying that- my baby's bad, Carmen, just different. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) my baby behaves so, so, so well that we joke that they know that we are in the middle of the pandemic and no one can come to help us. Like you cannot even hire a person because you don't know what that person is doing. So it's like, it's as if they knew, you know, it's like, yeah. Let's have like a low profile and not make like a lot of noise just in case, you know, it's, it's like that. <laughs> and I can confirm that we, we ha- we're having a lot of meetings, Carmen and I, and the, the baby usually is always there. It's always fine. It's like joining the meeting very quietly, not bothering or anything. I, I'm impressed, honestly. That is really encouraging. <laughs> I'm going to come back and bite you in the butt later, Carmen. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I want to make like a last comment on the, um, the point that Michelle raised about the fact that you should consider more um, the, your family and your family plans than actually your work. I mean, you all also have to, to put into account, take into account the work, but I've heard a lot of people uh, saying, oh, should I let my mentor know before, even before I want to um, plan to have kids or these sort of things. And I, I really, I'm like, um, no, that is, that is like your decision, a decision with your partner and your personal decision. So I think you really should choose perhaps if you're not a lab leader yet, uh, then you should choose a mentor that supports your life outside work. What do you think about that? So I don't think that it's a discussion that you have with your boss in any capacity before you decide to have a baby. It's quite frankly, none of their business, you know, what you choose to do. I totally agree that, you know, I feel like you get a sense of um, what your mentor, like if you're a trainee, how your, uh, how your boss feels about children. If you've had other people in the lab who've had babies and, you know, I, I mean, obviously it's important if your life is going to be miserable at work afterwards, but again, it's not a decision that you would discuss with them beforehand. I do think that communication between, if you're a trainee between your mentor and yourself is incredibly important after you've decided to have have a baby and after, you know, some people may actually even struggle to try to have a baby and that becomes a part of their life as well. But, you know, after you're either you're, you know, if you're a male, your wife is having a child and you're interested in paternity leave, or if you're a female and you're pregnant at work and you want to know, you know, how things are going to work after the baby is born to have communication with your boss. Like, I feel like, you know, different universities, different states, they all have different rules. And you can certainly count on whatever the university guaranteed mandates are for maternity leave and paternity leave. But after that, I even think, especially in academia, there's a lot of flexibility. And that may be adjusting your schedule, working more from home, um, you know, potentially writing a grant after the eight weeks or whatever that you're home with your, you know, after you're done with your, your university sanctioned maternity leave or whatever, so that you can spend another four weeks or something at home um, and continue writing and working, but still spend time working, you know, still spend time with the baby. So I don't think it's a discussion that you would have with any employer prior to deciding to have a family. Yeah, so luckily we have other PIs here today. So I'm seeing Matt here. So Matt, what do you have to say about that? (laughs) Let's see. I'm interested also in your opinion. (laughs) Um, I mean, I I totally agree with Michelle, first off. Like, you should do what you want. And if, I, I guess I look at this from both sides. Like, you should never have to talk to your boss about this. On the same side, if you're really worried about what your boss is going to say, you're in a bad situation with or without kids. I agree 100%, Matt. So I, I guess I, I see it from both sides. Um, the, the only, and I don't know how exactly, maybe Michelle can comment on this, the only thing that I, as a PI, would be concerned about with regard to having someone in my lab have a kid would be that in many labs, particularly in chemistry labs, there are chemicals that you could be working with that could be potentially hazardous to the child itself. And as a PI, I would never want to even be remotely partially involved in putting somebody's child in that kind of harm. 
Does that make sense? We obviously do everything we can to use PPE and things like this in labs, but uh, if, I, if I knew that, I'd be like, okay, we're getting someone else to do that part of the project. Yeah, well, Ivan has been doing perfusions for me, so I think can yeah. relate up on that. Uh, so I was sharing this with Carmen. Um, when I uh, when I discovered I was pregnant, I wasn't very happy about that, and I cried a lot, a lot, a lot for months. Uh, but I think um, one funny thing is the first person who knew, apart from my husband, obviously, was my boss. But the reason is I totally trust her, and I really wanted her to to know, and I knew she was going to support me, and she supported me a lot, like really a lot from from the beginning. And she told me, "Don't cry; it's not that bad." <laughs> so uh, she was really supportive. So I didn't ask her before, obviously, but I think again that it's true that you really need to 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 know that your PI is going to support you and that makes you feel much better and confident about you being able to go back at the pace you were before. That means that your life is going to help you to accommodate to your new life in, in some way. And they are not going to judge you differently because you are in a new family status. So that was my situation and I've been very lucky from that point of view. It's also true that uh, Every person is different. So for instance, I didn't use all my parental leave. I have used like two weeks of it for <laughs> practically. I immediately went back to the lab because I missed the lab too much and, and everything. But it's not something I would advise anyone to do. I think that what you need to do is to follow your own rules and not what people are expecting from you to do. Because for instance, in my case, I probably because of my culture I was having a lot of pressure from people in my country especially to take a long leave and do like the breastfeeding for two years and do like a bunch of stuff that as I'm saying I'm not disagreeing or saying it's wrong I'm saying it's not for me and and you need to feel supported by your people also regarding that. Uh, so Carmen you mentioned parental leave that's our second topic so practically, when to think about it, I guess when you're pregnant, <laughs> but um, what, what do you think that we need to know and, and how we should prepare for the parental leave? So I think like what Ivan said is, I mean, he, in his position, I'm not really quite sure what it was, but wasn't afforded very much parental leave. In the United States, obviously, parental leave isn't a priority. Um, you know, we have, you know, if you work for the right employer, you're guaranteed 12 weeks of unpaid time to leave to have a baby. But for most people, excuse me, that's not a possibility. I think as a grad student, like at Virginia Tech right now, it's um, eight weeks um, of paid, or no, six up to six weeks of paid leave. Um, at the university where I was uh, before I came here when I was pregnant with my kids, both as a graduate student um, and postdoc, I think it was like 20, 20 uh, business days, so which means with weekends, you have a month of paid leave. You could still take the additional, you know, the full 12 weeks of family medical leave, but that last, however much of it was gonna be unpaid. So I think, you know, that's really important, especially if you're young and if you're a graduate student and you don't have very much money and you don't have any kind of money set aside, that becomes a really big deal, right? Like, you know, if I don't go to work, I'm not gonna get paid. Um, so I think obviously, if you have the luxury of planning ahead of time, this is something that you would want to think about ahead of time to know what the rules are at your university and what they are for your significant other, whether they're at the university or someplace else. So now at Virginia Tech, both uh, the husband and the wife can take an equal amount of time. They, graduate students, students can both take up to six weeks. And for faculty, I think it's uh, like eight or 12 weeks of paid vacation. I don't, I don't know, Carmen, did you count as a faculty member? Uh, when you're a poster, you count as a faculty member, or if at least I did, and there were eight weeks of what is like parental leave per se that is fully paid. But you can add, uh, uh, if you have like um, family sick days or your sick days, because for instance, in my case, because I'm the woman I was recovering. So those are, uh, with all the things that I had like banked, it was almost like other 
four weeks, I think, or something like that. I had like a bunch of time for me. It was too much. That's something I can't say. But um, again, it's it's a bit depending on the person. And it's true that um, in America, there is way less time compared to Europe or to most of the countries in Europe. But you also have another advantage that, for instance, in, in Spain, you don't have. That is that it's much more flexible. Because, for instance, I could choose if I want to come only some days a week or some hours a day or things like that. And in Spain, at least, it's not that flexible. So I think that when you're in academia, that is ideal. The, the fact that you can decide how you want to use your parental leave. So uh, to Europeans going, be living in America or that they move to America and they can be scared from that point of view, saying that it's not the same system and they are not going to have too much time. I would, like, I would tell them to look at the bright side and say, okay, you are not having that much time, but you're having much more flexibility from that point of view. And, and, and I think that you might be covered for a long time considering yeah. that. I, you know, I, like you said, I think it's really different moving from here to like a Western European country. I'm assuming it's similar in Australia, but I don't know. But I would think if you're a postdoc in Europe thinking about coming to the United States and you're at a time in your life when you're thinking about wanting to have a child, honestly, this is a discussion I would have with the person I'm going to work with. This is a time when you'd be like, you know what, I'm 28 years old. My husband and I are thinking about having a family. I would either talk to the other people in the lab to see, you know, you know, if other people had children and talk to the PI at that time, because that's a major, you know, moving across an ocean uh, to another country that you'd want to make sure that the person that you're going to work with is fairly flexible in terms of having children. And the other thing to keep in mind, I think, is, you know, not all babies come when they're supposed to. Not all babies come home with you when they're supposed to come home. Um, and so all these things kind of play into that. And I think, you know, the one thing that Carmen was saying about being in academia is I do feel like there is more flexibility built into that than in other types of positions with similar pay, right? And I guess there's one thing about academia that makes it a little bit harder, but this now kind of applies to most professional jobs where you have to, most people don't get to work near their family which is i'm lucky enough that my mom lives pretty close so that really saved our our butts during the uh pandemic so when there is an emergency uh it's nice to have people nearby if you can make some kind of social group or sub like allo family or whatever of uh, so, some kind of support group beyond just between your husband and your wife or whatever i would recommend trying to do that because just there are some times they're just like, can you do it? No, I can't do it. Neither of us can do it. The child has to live alone. Like that's not an option. So you don't have to find an entire village to raise your family, but it probably takes the edge off if you can find some good friends or some acceptable family members around, <laughs> which academia makes it harder because you end up moving where the position is rather than necessarily where you're, mm -hmm. I don't know. So pick your least employable family member and make them come with you. I was going to say, you know, <clears throat> one of the things I did and, uh, is that, you know, like when I even said when those situations occurred, we're like, what are we going to do? Like, who's going to get them here or do this or whatever? Again, this is a situation where, for instance, so my husband, when, my, when, I, when I had all four of my kids, uh, worked in 24 hour shifts. So he worked 24 hours and then he was home for 48 hours. So that 24 hours was always, it was me with four kids, right? And our schedules became quite kind of, you know, irregular. And sometimes like when my first baby was born, um, you know, I worked at night every third day. So every third day, someone came to watch my kid at night when my husband was gone. And that, you know, I spent the day with them. And then that, that, that third, every third day, I would work from like four until, you know, the wee hours of the next morning. And so this is, again, a job where you have the flexibility, assuming that your, you know, your significant other is okay with you, you know, like, peace out, you know, it's dinner time, I'm going to work. You, this is something that you can do that other people I don't think have. Like, you know, this is not all roses, right? But, it, you know, again, there is this flexibility built into this position. I would suggest marrying someone with slightly less ambition than you. I did the opposite. My wife is like super successful corporate 
lady. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> I mean, I like having the money she makes, but other than that, it's kind of a pain. So that brings up another point that finding a good part, finding a partner who has, who also is a, is a strong parent is, I feel like absolutely critical. At least for me, it was, I couldn't do this job without my husband. He's guess, a better parent than I am. <laughs> that's they probably pretty it. good well, general advice. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. Uh, that goes for a lot of things in, in, in our academic career, especially as women and, and having a, a good partner and a supportive partner and, and something that really can change the game sometimes. It goes also for, for, for men, uh, but sometimes uh, as women, I feel that we, we really need to, to have a supportive partner. I feel your pain. I accidentally married Don Draper without realizing it. Yeah, that it's true about, uh, especially for women needing having a person supporting you, but for one reason is that historically women are were supposed to stay at home and take care of the babies and everything. But that's the only reason why it's like the role that society is has given to us for a long time and not actually something that make it real per se. So it's like more about perception and it's a perception that you might even have yourself because of how you have been raised and you need to fight against it. So that's like mainly the thing in, in my opinion. But I've been seeing, I have seen Ivan struggling with childcare and everything, all the pandemic. And I don't think it's easier for him. <laughs> for yeah. I think my wife picked me because she thought this is a baby raising person. Like he worked in a daycare. Uh, <laughs> just her brood mare. About flexibility, I wanted to share something for from you from Europe and especially from Italy. So there is, um, of course, in Italy we we have like more um, parental leave. I, I don't even know how many months it is, but I think it should be like five, six months, something like that. Uh, which compared to here, when I started to to get information, it seemed it <sighs> seems like a lot. Uh, but there is also another thing that I actually don't like about that, um, about what, what they do in Italy. So at least in my previous institution where I did my PhD, I did that in Trieste and in an institution which is called SISA. And, and what they do for us biologists working in a lab, uh, as soon as you know that you're pregnant, you should communicate it to the supervisor or to other administrative people. And you're not supposed to enter the lab anymore. So you basically like, not allowed to enter the lab uh, for like, I don't know, when you know it, like eight months, seven months. And, and that can really slow down your career. So, okay, they give you a lot of months before or after whenever you want to take them. But then they're also forcing you to slow down because, I mean, of course, there is some substances that you're not allowed to touch or it, it's dangerous to work with, but there is a whole other bunch of things that you can totally do in the lab and you can keep working because you're not sick, you're just pregnant. So that is something that I, I found a little bit weird. And I had a couple of colleagues that actually had to slow down their PhD. They were, they were graduate students at the time a lot because they almost they lost more than one year because they were forced to stop working even before for these, regulation that I guess they were put in place to protect the women and the safety, but they were actually going also a little bit against the career of the women. So um, that was a little bit weird. I think when you have a baby, you should be able to legally take a year off your life, just like you physiologically are. You should just say like, I'm one year younger, actually, on all forms. Uh, I, I totally disagree and fully disagree. And I'm going to share this experience that happened to me and and learned about, and that I suffered this, and it's some kind, and, and, and that, that's something I needed to discuss with my PI. I was the first woman in my PI's lab to be pregnant, even if there were other people that already had kids. So I think it was also like an experiment for her. And I read about this uh, thing that sometimes we, she wanted like to protect me from working too much or doing this or doing that. So that can mean also that she's prevented me from having some opportunities that I would have some somehow in another way. So I really need to talk to her at some point because she was telling me, oh, you're working too much. You're having too much on your plate and I want to relieve you. 
And I had to tell her, okay, why are you doing this? It's be, it's a, no, because you're pregnant. I say, yeah, but I'm demonstrating I'm working less than my coworkers. I am decreasing my productivity. I'm working worse. There's some reason that it's making you think that I need this. Because if I need this, I will do it. But I don't feel I need it. So you don't can't take my, that decision for me. I have to do it. So I, I think that that conversation was productive. And she really understood that that was not the way for me to do it. So I think it's okay to have the opportunity to stop for a while if you want to adapt for that, but I don't think it should be something forced at all because for instance for me, so I was working from home on a grant with my PI one week after having my child and I went back to the lab full time like six weeks after having my baby and being more time at home would have made me like become crazy. I can tell you that. For sure. And it helped me so much to be me again, work in the lab again. That helped me a lot. So I would make that rule. <laughs> I believe made a hilarious joke about how women should be one year younger if they have kids. But it, it's actually worth, worth noting just for those people who are uh, um, applying for things like fellowships and things, a lot of grant agencies will offer ex uh, time extensions on deadlines for people who do have kids, both men and women. I actually, so for example, the, the it for through the NIH, the K99 grant is a really common mechanism that a lot of people want to get because it kind of is kind of a golden ticket for getting faculty jobs here in the US. And it's also one of the few grants that international students can apply for. Most agencies will, usually you have to four years of getting your PhD. Uh, but I know multiple people who have successfully petitioned to get an additional year on that timeline due to having kids. So a lot of grant agencies are are willing to basically make you one year younger. That's cool. That's true. There is also some other um, Marie Curie actions that are, I think they're more recent and there are these big postdoctoral um, grants in, in Europe and they, there are some specific ones for mothers that took some time off to allow them to go back to, to work, to academia. I was just gonna add to what Matt said that, you know, this extends into when you get your first faculty position, you can extend your tenure clock by a year um, for, you know, if, if you have a baby. And, um, you know, most of our big grants come from the NIH. And, um, you know, as a new investigator applying for a grant, you have an advantage in that you can get a lower score and still get funded. And that applies to early stage investigators who are a certain period of time away from their postdoc. And that can also, that time period is also extended um, or can be extended if you've had children in between when you graduated and got your PhD and when you're applying for that grant. If you have triplets, do you get three years? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know, I didn't ask actually. <laughs> In Europe, if you have uh, this in Spain, if you have like, we call it multiple childbirth, that's a direct translation. I don't know how you call it in English, but you have uh, more than one kid at a time. They give you extra time. It's not double the time, but it's more time for everything. That's nice. Uh, that's fair. <laughs> I guess it's double or triple the work, so you should get more time. <laughs> Okay, so the next topic, I think we, we touched it already, productivity and parenthood. How did you manage um, your productivity after the child were born? So there's definitely, I feel like a period of time, like an immediate period when you're at home with your baby where things are different. What I found for me is that I became much more efficient in short bursts of time. Like I didn't come into lab and start an experiment and I hung out for like eight or nine hours and did things or, you know, spent a day working on a manuscript or whatever, I, I became, and I'm still this way now, actually, that I can only do things for short periods of time, but during those short periods, whether it's an hour or 90 minutes, like I can get intensely focused and I feel like be really productive. But I, I really feel that it comes down to efficiency. I feel like I myself have gotten more efficient as the size of my family has increased. I do think productivity changes. I don't think it, I, I just think it changes just because your lifestyle changes. And so when you're productive at work changes, I think for every, every person, they have a different formula that works for them. So I've worked with 
faculty. So in the School of Neuroscience, half of our faculty are females and the majority of them have small children at home. And they all have different things that they do. So I'm an early morning person. I wake up at like 4.15 and I like to start, I get immediately get on my computer with a cup of coffee and start working. But there are faculty who work at night after their kids go to bed. So it's just like your schedule is more disrupted. So you, I feel like you work in like in blocks rather than in a continuous period of time during a work day. I think um, uh, something to consider with productivity and parenthood too is that you're going to have weird curveballs that you're just going to have to roll with. So every once in a while something's going to happen that's going to make your productivity decline for a little while and you just have to expect that. So if your kid gets sick and you're just going to have to take off some days, especially if you're somewhere where it's just you and your your spouse or just you, uh, it's going to take a little hit and you'll just have to figure out a way to make up time. Or for example, if there's a giant global plague that never ends that causes all schools to close, that might require some changes in your behavior, possibly. <laughs> Childcare, I would also think like, if you're planning to have a kid, go ahead and figure out childcare early as possible, because that is gonna be really important. I mean, having a, a baby in your house is a full, or a kid in your house is a full-time job in its own, so you need to give that job to someone else as soon as possible, <laughs> if your spouse likes working. And then just kind of try to, in, in order to avoid a lot of conflict, it's a good idea to talk well ahead of time about if the baby gets sick, what are we going to do? That kind of stuff. So your productivity can be higher if you have plans with your partner and as many resources outside of your partner as possible. And if there's a plague, I, I don't know. Your, your grandma. Ivan made a really good point, though. He said... There may be times when your productivity goes down, but you figure out ways to make it up. And honestly, I feel like whether you're a graduate student or whether you're a postdoc or whether you're a PI, you have to be productive to be successful. So this is not, you have to get papers, you have to get grants, you, you know what I mean? And so you have to find a way to make stuff work because as a postdoc, if you have two babies or three babies and don't publish any papers. I mean, if you want to stay in academia, that's, that formula is not going to work, right? So, so I feel like you do have to, you know, the one thing that this job does afford is the flexibility so that when life does throw you curveballs, and Ivan is absolutely right, your schedule is, gets screwed up all the time. Like what you thought you were going to do today, you're like, well, we've got a fever and an ear infection and you, my husband can't take them to the doctor. So I'm going to do that and get stuck at home. And you need to have to say, well, if I can't do it today, maybe I could do it on Saturday or maybe I can do it tonight. And I feel like that's just the way this, I honestly feel this, that's how the job is, whether it should be that way or not, it is that way. And don't think they'll get sick the way that you get sick, which is just every once in a while, because childcare is like, you know how you make a hand wicked, a candle. It's like you're hand wicking your child into a Petri dish of germs every time you take them and then they come out and they cough in their mouth, your mouth. So you'll also get sick a lot too. So plan for that. I guess, but, uh, I guess childcare yeah. is a very good point to take into consideration, especially here in California. I've been told that you should look for childcare as soon as you know that you're pregnant um, because they also fill up pretty quickly. And, and so you, there, it's definitely something you, you want to plan ahead, like you both were saying. Yeah, and there's sometimes you'll take somebody... There's wildly different um, quality of care at different places too, at least in my experience. So we were lucky enough to find like a little Montessori school, which was super sweet and nice. But before that, it was just like, uh, there's a lady on Craigslist who doesn't want to be a waitress anymore, but her fingernails are very long and she's just going to give her cheesesteaks. And she explained that her husband has had all these different colon cancers from eating the food that she's going to feed my child. Like, uh, it's almost the same price too. It's very annoying. There's a very like, it goes from very expensive to extremely expensive, despite the fact that you could be maybe getting like awesome care. We seriously consider pretending to convert to Judaism because they have a good kindergarten school. So you'll make sacrifices to get a good, good place. 
I, I think depending on where you end up living too, if you live in the Northeast, um, I have faculty, I have friends who are faculty there who the husband and the wife are both faculty members, but they actually can't afford to have a second child because they can't afford uh, child care for the second child, even though they're both pulling in over $100,000 a year. It's really challenging, right, in some places. So that that those types of things are going to factor into your decision of whether you're going to have more kids, whether you're going to stay where you are or relocate. And those are things that you would want to consider. Yeah, we were surprised when we found out that child care cost more than our rent. It was our single biggest bill. But if we have a second child, the, you get 10% off. Hooray. Yeah, if you have a second child, it's cheaper to get uh, an au pair or something like that, I guess. Um, I don't know. I think that this topic about how productivity, how having a child affects productivity, it's a very interesting topic. And I really like what, um, what Jake posted here. So I was trying to find that that graph for a while because I was talking about it to Carmen. Um, so when I, I, I described before how I told my PI that I was pregnant even before my parents. So she was the very first person to know it. Um, so she told me, oh, don't worry. Women normally after having children, they, became, they become more productive when they are in academia and everything. So I expected something magic to happen and become like super productive and blah, blah, blah. And no, it didn't happen. It didn't work that way for me. So uh, I think that maybe what happens is more that the women who stay in academia are the ones that can really learn to, to master this art of becoming more <laughs> productive or being more efficient i would say more efficient than, than productive in fact it's like you, you that's what you do unfortunately i don't think it's the case for me i don't think i work faster or better or anything in the same amount of time i don't maybe something is something i will learn with time and i hope it's the case but for me being productive at the level i was before it would be very very challenging if i didn't have my husband staying at home with the baby Honestly, that is yeah. That's another that's thing. You, your husband's or your partner's career choices start to matter a lot more in your career choices when you have a kid. Because when we first started, we decided, okay, I have six month child. I'm doing PhD program. My wife works a sixty hour job. We're not going to change anything. We're both just going to get cancer and die before we're forty. That's the plan. We'll just both go full and. We haven't really changed the plan, but uh, we've found a few little workarounds. So now we're aiming to die at 60, but it's still not ideal. So if you can have a partner that works from home, that's cool. <laughs> Especially one that can actually do some childcare while they do it. I think it's interesting to like, so I was in a lab where we had babies for two years, not we as in everyone, but like the lab had like four babies between like three people in a single year, I'm pretty sure. And so, like, all of us probably, everyone around us was like, oh, yeah, like, it's, it's almost as if we could predict things, like, how they're going to handle it. But going back to productivity, they all were really, really efficient people. They were some of the most efficient people I've seen in my whole life. And I actually always said this to them. I was like, I feel like I learned more about efficiency from, like, these people who are pregnant than anyone else in my entire PhD. And it's, like, so true. But, like, I think one thing I saw from all three of them is that, it's okay to not be productive because you're going to the number of times because there's three of them like the number of times i see every day like i have to go now i have to pick stuff from my childcare because like he's coughing or like you know they get calls all of a sudden and i have to leave and i think just accepting that it's okay and it it happens and you're just gonna have to live with it it, it will happen yeah i think this is a problem not just in academia i think it's probably a societal one where we're we no longer have a financial system where one person can go out and make enough money for a middle-class family. So we haven't quite adjusted to that as a society. Yeah. Eventually we have to say like, Hey guys, we can't, we can't burn both people out and still have kids because we would prefer to keep having society going and you need new kids for that. And if we stop all the people that are ambitious from having kids, that might not be the best plan forever. Um, so I think there's, Big things that society will end up probably having to do, like support childcare, so that people that might want to have a second kid, it is not 
impossible. Like there's a, VT is trying. They send a lot of like, what can we do to help like a faculty or staff or graduate students with kids? And it's usually like a list of college babysitters or something. It's also in the Women's Center, which is a little bit sexist because they send emails to me. But I think just cash. Eventually, we might decide as a society just to start subsidizing it a little bit, childcare, because it's such an insane, it's so, I don't know why it's, I mean, I guess it makes sense that it's so expensive, but um, if you want quality childcare and not just your kids roped into a yard, eventually, I think as a society of people that are more and more having these double household incomes, we might eventually figure out how to do it successfully. I'm hoping that's not specific to academia though, but I always just write on the surveys, cash please. But it hasn't worked so far. I, I wrote the same thing, Ivan, if that helps you. <laughs> yeah. But I, I don't think that some, I, I feel like some of the challenges that we face as parents in academia are no different than any other demanding career. Right. So, you know, there are advantages and disadvantages of being in academia and having children. But for anyone in a demanding career, they're facing the same challenges with dealing with, you know, like balance, you know, this whole work life balance, how to deal with kids and school and daycare and drop off and gymnastics and Boy Scouts and cello and right. These are all things that are happening all the time for any but any any parent. And so I think what Ivan indicated is that it's kind of more, it's, it's like the way society views how, how important raising kids is, how important daycare is, being able to subsidize childcare and supporting young parents. So like Carmen, you know, you have said, had said that you're not as productive, but you have a new baby, right? And that's not the same as having 10 year old kids at home, right? Who my kids are in the other room. I told them if they make any noise while I'm talking, I'm going to go in and, you know, <laughs> send them to their bedrooms, right? It's a totally different ball game, right? With a new baby at home. And I think it's okay to not be super productive for the six months or the one year after your baby is born, but you will eventually adjust. I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I wouldn't tell people to have the expectations that they're going to become more productive. That is what I am trying. I, I, don't, I don't think you become, I, I don't, I'm not saying that you become more productive. I just think that you find a way to make things work, right? And whether that's being more efficient. So for me, it's, you know, like I said, being more efficient in these little blocks of time, but yeah. other people are going to have a totally different formula that works for them. Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, I really love my job and, and I'm going to make it work. I don't know how yet. And as I'm saying, I'm really lucky because my husband works from home and he can take care of the baby because we have like, he, he starts to work after that. And I'm very lucky from that point of view. But still, I was a bit disappointed <laughs> because I was really expecting to be careful. There's nothing much. miraculous that happens after you have babies. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I was like, oh, yeah, you're going to become so productive while you have a baby. And I was like, oh, really? Great. And later <laughs> I came back and I said, okay, where's my productivity? Where's my efficiency? I'm not seeing it. And I was slightly disappointed. So I, I want to believe it's going to happen. <laughs> I don't remember expecting to be more productive. I remember hallucinating for a couple months where I would spend up all night just looking at the baby, make sure it's breathing, and then be like, just see oh streamers on my fingers but uh, uh i'm surprised you thought you'd be more productive i mean that's what everyone was telling me <laughs> who was telling you that <laughs> stephanie I mean, maybe, told me harrison tyber told me people told me i was going to be more, more efficient <laughs> i think they were pranking you yeah probably I, not right after the, the baby's born like a little bit after uh, okay. <laughs> like not the month after i mean you do get I guess you get more of a sense of purpose. They're like, well, I can't just become a beach bum now. That's no longer an option. Like you do have to, I can see how it would affect your commitment because um, it's not just about you anymore. Now they need food and living inside and such. There is also the thing that Carmen thinks that she's not productive at all. Like she thinks that she should do more even when she wasn't pregnant. So. I think it's just your state of mind. I mean, if you went straight back to lab after you said six weeks, I mean, I'm sure your productivity is, is still the same and it's just you. 
uh, thinking that it's not <laughs> because how you're made. I would agree with that. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Okay, this is becoming too personal about me being no. Okay, let's let's move on. Can, can I, I Carmen, to, you have too many people that knows you here in this call, so. <laughs> I, I want to bring up something to ask Ivan and Michelle. Um, one of the things that I noticed uh, among when I was a postdoc, other postdocs who had kids. I don't have kids, so I have like no experience here. That's why I'm trying to ask more questions and listen because I have no actual experience. But one thing I noticed about uh, two-income households. Uh, amongst the postdocs is that they tried to do things like um, hire someone to clean the house so that they could just try and take things off their plate when possible. Like basically just anything that's not taking care of the kid at work, let's see if we can just make that go away. Have you guys noticed that or do you think that's a good idea? Um, so I think you should do whatever you think is going to make your life better. So I have feel like I have some OCD, so I'm not really quite sure how I'd feel about someone in my house cleaning my house. I fantasize about that sometimes, but I know that works for people and I know some people do that. And it's if, if there's something that releases some stress somewhere, I mean, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, if I can say something, I think that one of the reasons why I consider academia not friendly for families is the salaries. So I live in Roanoke, so I don't have a problem with that because luckily the salary is very similar for a postdoc is very similar everywhere. But if you go to other places where life is much more expensive, you can afford less things. And I think that that's what makes academia harder for families compared to other jobs. Because if you have this level of education and you are working somewhere else, you're normally better paid. So that also means how much you can do with your money. Can you afford a person for cleaning your house? Can you afford more child care? Can you? So that's what I think is the biggest challenge as an I academic is that you don't have that much money to, that gives you freedom to make these kind of decisions easily. I think the biggest problem is, is moving away from social support systems that you might have. Like, I don't know why we decide as the group that thinks they're the smartest people that we've decided we're all fine with being migrant workers. Specifically right now during this pandemic, when we were doing our tiny isolation bubble where it was just me, my wife, and my daughter in a room, I would say my productivity went down to like negative something where I was actively forgetting how to do things. But then we eventually brought in my, my uh, mother to do like a few days a week and that was a lifesaver. And if we would hadn't had that option, that would have been a lot harder. So I think one of the, the really difficult things is why don't we just have good universities everywhere and then you work where you are i don't know i guess that's impossible but uh but that's one of the things that might be different than some other professions is the necessity of traveling to a place that you have no real plan ahead of time to ever have lived even if you're in the same city right like here for example in sydney it's very bustling it's a big city everything is in sydney you don't have to move outside of the, the city but then you travel like two hours to work or an hour and a half. And literally they have to like, all the postdocs and the PhD students around me, they were like, oh, this is, this childcare center is like booked for the rest of like up to a year in advance. Oh God, what do I do now? And there's all these other considerations as well. It's like, oh, my grandma's like, my mom's living there and everything. And it's like, it's, it's still inconvenient, I guess. Like if you don't have proper planning, obviously if you move out, it's a bit more, you know, the social support is like less so there. I guess we can move on to the next one. Um, so we we thought about talking a little bit of stereotypes, maternity versus paternity, and what would you change in academia to make it more family friendly? I guess we, we already talked a little bit about that. Would you like to add something, Michelle and Ivan? You wanna go first, Ivan? Um, I guess there's, I don't think it's specific to academia more than anywhere else, but I guess there is the assumption kind of that childcare, we still have the assumption that it's basically on the mom with however much help they can get from a husband rather than being whichever partner. Like I mentioned before, if you want help with family stuff from VT, you go to the woman's center, which is a little bit funny. I, I don't know. I think I'm lucky to be in a lab that's very uh, progressive about that. They they know that I'm, for the most part, the primary childcare person in my family. Not that my wife doesn't do a lot. It's just that her job is literally meetings 
from eight in the morning sometimes to like six at night. And that means if something comes up, it's usually me more likely than her that's going to be able to change things up. I don't know. Maybe this is something that Michelle or, or Carmen could answer more. But I don't know. Is there more stigma towards hiring women because of the assumption that they might become pregnant in the near future or something like that? Honestly, I, I'm not really, I mean, I, we have hired faculty who are pregnant. We have interviewed faculty who are pregnant either here or at my previous institution. Um, um, <clears throat> at the faculty level, I'm not really quite sure that that makes any difference. Um, That's good. You know, I think that may have been different, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. You wouldn't want to admit to the person who's hiring you that, oh, by the way, you can't tell yet, but I'm pregnant, right? Um, but I feel like now it's probably not that big of a deal. I remember when I interviewed here, one of the faculty who actually came out to dinner, who was hosting me, showed up to the dinner with her baby in a papoose, like at the dinner, right? So I think it probably also depends on the environment in which you're working. I know Virginia Tech, at least at the faculty level, is a really family friendly place in terms of being accommodating to people having to leave. I mean, there are so many faculty here with young children. Um, Do you think that depends on the field at all? Like where fields that have become more female dominated, like neuroscience, compared to, I don't know, what's the one that's yeah, still so traditionally male dominated? If you are getting that physics in the physics department, physics. it may not yeah. be the same, right? Yeah. So it may, there may be stereotypes associated with different, um, different fields. I, it's probably or, still there. Or regions or parts of the con um, countries that you're working in. I don't know. I personally think that there is stigma. I mean, it's not that I personally think so. I'm very interested in how women have to face challenges in STEM. It's a topic that I've been working on since I was a, a PhD student in Spain. I've been in several associations about that. And uh, there are studies about that. There are studies about, so there was this interesting study uh, in which they were, uh, there was a person um, attending to the meetings that were happening after um, an interview with a candidate for a faculty position. And what they were saying, it's mainly if you're a woman and you're in a reproductive age and all these things, they were discussing about how likely it was that the woman is, were going, was going to leave for following her husband's job, but not the opposite. So if you were a man, they were not discussing about it. So unfortunately, I think there are still stereotypes about how women have to sacrifice their careers for their family, to follow their, husband, their husbands or for having kids and, and all these things. And while we are trying to change how the system works and how people think, I think we're unfortunately not still not at the point where this is actually being true everywhere. It's part opinion and part facts, because as I'm saying, there are studies, the studies about the topic. So if you're asking me if I have personally faced that, not really, but a little bit. For instance, I don't know if you remember, there was a, a lab meeting we had and I was, and uh, I shared that I was planning to go to this College Spring Harbor conference that was one month and a half after my baby was born. And one lab member told me, oh, you cannot go because you are going to have a baby. And I was like, oh, really? <laughs> Thank you for letting me know. I mean, it's like, <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's not up to you to even mention that because I'm a mom, you know? And I don't know. I think that these things, unfortunately, happen in academia more than, than, than what we think or one that we believe. And we're still far from really considering women that they have the same level of priority for their careers as men do. At, at least that's my impression. I think that might also be larger cultural stuff too. You've mentioned that your family gives you a lot of flack for kind of following a career path that would be more traditionally paternal, right? Carmen, is that not true? Oh yeah, I mean, family and, and tradition, this is like very related, but as I'm saying, we're talking about what happens in the work environment. So this comment about me not going there or here or whatever was done in the lab by a lab member and no one thought that that was inappropriate, but I was like, okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> I found it inappropriate to question how I should spend my time or how, uh, or, or decide to take one opportunity for my career after having my child. Uh, because I didn't, I never saw anyone telling anything like that to a lab member of the lab that was a male. 
So I would like to welcome Martina that joined the, the call. Hi, Martina. Hello. So I explained the problem about a time change that I didn't tell you that was swifted. And I'm very happy that you made it, even though we are through the end of the talk. But at least we can ask you one of the most important questions that we have in the end. So let me introduce you um, very quickly. So Martina has a master in biotechnology and she recently submitted her PhD thesis on food integrity. And during her PhD, she developed um, applied spectroscopy and mass spectrometry methods to assess um, food quality and authenticity on different food metrics um, like oil, milk, butter, and coffee. Um, so I think what is worth really to share for, especially for this session, so she sent me uh, some lines to share her story even even before uh, she joined when I invited her because I knew she had a baby and so during her and correct me if I'm wrong Martina so during mm -hmm. your last um, year of PhD you became pregnant and then uh, your pregnancy was hard from both the physical point of view and also emotional point of view and also because you lost your mother uh, when you were five months pregnant so I guess that must have been very hard and also you gave birth during the lockdown right so you had a six month old daughter during the lockdown and during that time you managed to submit your thesis so I think you're a hero for all of that <laughs> they're all of that <laughs> things all together so thank you very much for joining us uh even for a little bit in, in the end so yeah, that's correct. That's my story. So uh, I became pregnant because uh, I wanted to. So we, we, me and my partner, we decided to do it, uh, even if I was doing a PhD. And uh, reading online and also on Twitter, uh, a lot of women are asking, should I wait until the end of my PhD? And I think, no, because there is never the right time to have a child and for that same reason it's always the right time so at the end if you want to somehow you will manage to i didn't have any kind of support from my supervisor or from the university so we were actually alone doing that but uh, i'm happy <laughs> that i did it and i think that also having a child helped me to be uh, a better scientist uh, and to manage my time better because now I don't have time to procrastinate. So if I have to write my thesis, I have to write it. And uh, yes, I wrote it during the lockdown uh, when my child was asleep. So in this 20 minutes frame, I managed to, to do it. It's not easy, of course. Uh, it, it will not be become easier during time but uh, i don't know why women and also men should put their life on hold just because they are in academy thank you martina you touched basically most uh, most of the points that we talked about so far <laughs> <laughs> and i think uh michelle and i will also agree with you um about what you said that there is well, uh, Ivan also, actually, he, he had uh, the baby at the beginning of your graduate school, right? So uh, he, he, we were saying that perhaps at the beginning of the graduate school could be a little bit more challenging. But anyway, that is like totally a personal decision. And we were encouraging people to take this personal decision with your partner instead of um, talking about it as with the mentor or and then definitely after you have to talk with your mentor but it is not something that um, they have any said in, in it so um, everybody definitely agree with you with that so um, okay so I'm gonna ask all the three invited uh, guests that we have today what is your this is like a totally open question what is your main suggestion and what was your biggest challenge I think Martina should go first since we haven't heard very much from her. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, the biggest challenge is, of course, uh, time management and uh, support. I don't know in the US how the situation is, but in Italy, it's really difficult to manage, to work and have a, have a child, regardless of the gender. So 
yes, of course, for women it is more difficult than for men, but uh, uh, child support is not uh, very good here. My university does not have a child support, so I need to put my child in, a, in another daycare. And uh, that means that uh, the time should be organized better. And also, um, at least my supervisor, he wants us in the lab from 8 a.m. until 6 p.m. So even when we are writing our thesis or manuscript, we cannot do it from home. We have to be in the lab because we are working only if we are in the lab from his point of view. And that's it also difficult and uh, will not help uh, parents. So uh, I think that the biggest challenges are uh, time management and support. I mean, if I could go back and do one thing differently, I would have married an independently wealthy woman. That solves all those problems right away. But realistically, yeah, I think you just being on the same page with your partner about things that are going to come up is important. And just preemptively go into marriage counseling, even if you're happy right now. Seems like a perfectly good idea to me, especially if you're both doing high stress, kind of high commitment careers and then if your wife starts becoming wildly more successful for you just remember that means you get the money too and don't be mad i yeah that's it for me um i i agree i think the biggest i think the biggest issues are time management but i think it's one of those things that you learn to adapt um i think communication with the you know if you're still a trainee with your um mentor is important um but i i think you know, you know, this idea that we've been talking about it, productivity, really it's about kind of reorganizing the way that you work so that you can be um, as productive as you think you should be, right? And it's really about time management. You're the, doing the same job as you were before, but now you're doing it managing a family. And so there has to be some, unfortunately for you, it doesn't sound like you have much flexibility, but you know, it's great if there's some little bit of flexibility so that, you know, your schedule can be reorganized or rearranged so that you can get what you need to get done when you have the opportunity to do it. Thank you. Thanks, all of you. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I agree that the time management would be one of the most challenging things. And um, so, Martina, before you, you touched the topic of the uh, child care and uh, before we were talking about that, I think there is many differences between Europe and, and uh, here, U.S., but here in the U.S., it's, we were discussing about the fact that it's pretty expensive. Um, sometimes it's like more than half of the salary. And <laughs> so um, there is also like money to take into account when, when you have a child. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, how is it like in Italy? Because now I, I never asked my friends in Italy that have children, um, is the child care... Uh, you have do you have to pay for the childcare or is it free like the other schools? No, you do you have to pay and it's also very expensive and that's one of the reasons because uh, many women decide not to work anymore after having mm. a child because it's more convenient not to work instead of part-time working and pay a babysitter or a childcare. So that's an issue. So perhaps uh, uh, Ivan is right. Uh, you have to ma marry a healthy woman or man. <laughs> that can solve a lot of problems. Like all, all the, the money can solve a lot of problems. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and I'm curious also to know from Martina, what are your plans for the future? Are you going to stay in academia? Because you, you just made your PhD thesis. So I'm curious to know what are your plans for the future? Uh, yes, my PhD was not founded, so I have to work full time during my PhD. Oh. And now I'm working as a science, teach science teacher in high school. And uh, my plan is to defend my thesis, <laughs> I hope by the end of the year, but I'm waiting from my supervisor to decide. And then I don't know if I want to stay in academia, but I want to do research. Since I'm working in the food um, quality system, also uh, something like uh, security or safety analysis lab uh, that can also be fine. Uh, academia is kind of problematic for me because uh, um, 
as you proceed in your career, you are doing less research and more budgeting and the bureaucracy. So that's not really what I aim to. I, I love to stay in the lab and do stuff. So I don't know. I'm open for the future. I think that 2020 told us that uh, we cannot really plan for the future and we have to take what uh, <laughs> destiny has for us. So I'm open to possibilities and now I'm just doing one step at a time. That is great. Um, do you all, all of you have any other suggestions that you want to share that we want to wrap up with? And the only thing I would say is that if you are in academia and you want to stay in academia and you desire to have a family, I think that it's possible. And I think that there are a lot, you know, find a woman role model if you, if you, if you feel that's necessary, but there are a lot of families, a lot of men and women who are doing this, a lot of people who are scientists that have young children. So I think it's, it's totally feasible. Ivan, do you have something to share? Some last suggestion? No, other than, I think we should go back to those Victorian practice of just tying your kid to a dog and they'd be fine. I put a picture there. That's what they used to do. You just pick a friendly largest dog and tie your toddler to it. And it seemed to work out fine. I don't know why we stopped. I think there are more allergies now and makes it more difficult. <laughs> mm, fair enough. That's why I didn't tie it to a peanut butter can, but um yeah, so I, the thing I would say it's, first of all, I think it's, it's great to have people as, as Michelle or uh, Ivan in, in my environment that they can see that it is hard, but it can be made. And, um, but I really think that we still have to do so much to um, promote the idea that uh, it's possible to be a good scientist and have a family, they are not exclusive, but they have to be supported because as we were saying, you don't want to lose talent in academia because they need to leave because the environment is not friendly enough. So I think that that's my idea. And somehow it goes a lot with mentality, uh, mindset in general. And one thing for me, one of the biggest challenges that I personally have to overcome is like sometimes the, the guilt, like feeling guilty because you're spending time, no matter what you're doing, if you're at work, you feel guilty because you are not at home. And if you're at home, you feel guilty because you're not working. That is pr probably something that it's mine. It's personally mine, but it's true that somehow it's easy to grew up with the idea that you really need to sacrifice yourself for your family. And uh, that doesn't help <laughs> to make it easier read, for you and you to read, that you can have a balanced life. You should read that Nature Shock book. It does a good job talking about how parents have almost no impact on adult temperament. It's kind of relieving. Like <laughs> your parenting, it, you should be nice to your kid the same way you would be nice to your spouse or a roommate, but you have almost no effect on who they're going to be. So that's good. So that takes a little bit of the guilt away. It's interesting. Do you have any other final suggestions, Martina? Well, I totally agree with Carmen and Michelle. So it's feasible to have an, a career in academia and being a parent. And mentorship is really important. So find a role model that can help you and uh, also give advice to how to manage all, all the stuff you have in your life. And uh, uh, I feel you, Carmen, when you're talking about the guilt. <laughs> I always feel guilt for some reason. Yes, I think that uh, we need to support one each other more. And uh, it's also a matter of mentality. So in academia, you have to work uh, 60 hours uh, a, a week to be productive. That, that's not true. That's not how our brain works. So the time should be used properly. That's what we have to learn and uh, how the mentality has to change. But uh, I'm, I'm positive we will manage and uh, uh, if we support each other and if we create a network, uh, it will be easier for all of us. Yeah, I think it would be nice. I feel like we have the same kind of system we had when everyone was expected to work really hard and then die when they're 60. Like, why isn't it okay? In, in most careers to just be like, uh, 
peace out for a couple of years. And then I come back to the exact same spot. I'm still the same person. And I'm still, you're going to get a lot of productive years out of me because I don't die when I'm 60. It seems like we're stuck in this idea that we have a very rigid track towards success, a very rigid timeline that's not really based on anything I can understand other than a historical context and doesn't need to be that way. Does that make sense? I totally agree. It, my story tells that because uh, I'm 30 and I'm finishing my PhD right now. I start a PhD right after my master's at 23, but uh, I drop out. I changed my career because I worked as a science teacher and then I came back to academia. So I think that uh, there is no right path. There is no a strict uh, schedule we have to follow. Every person is different. Every one of us has different timing to do stuff. So I yeah, totally I agree with you. I spent like 10 years working like as an outdoor instructor because it's more fun. And I figured I would not die for a long time unless I died on the job immediately and then all my problems are solved. So... It never really made sense to me, like, like the idea that you have to pretend like you're going to be in fatal decline in your late 50s. But yeah, that does seem to be the persuasive idea, though, is you need to go from boom, 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 boom. Even from childhood now, they expect you to start like, you got to be in the right daycare center if you're going to get in the right preschool. It doesn't seem like that makes a lot of sense as far as not crushing the human spirit. <laughs> Thanks to all of you. This was very inspiring. Your stories were very inspiring, very encouraging. Carmen, do you want to add something? I would like to uh, thank uh, the three guests that came here uh, for sharing that. But I would also like to thank all the people from Byron who suggested the topic, because I think it's a discussion that has to go on and continue in academia. And, and it's important to give visibility to... Uh, people with family that are demonstrating that both things are compatible and can be well done. So thanks to everyone. And I want to encourage everyone to do whatever they feel they need to do at that moment in their lives. That's what I would say. Yeah, I say we should, the message should be, it's compatible. It could be a lot more compatible with a few tweaks that could probably be pretty easily managed. It, yeah, it's harder. Could, yeah. yeah. It's just, I, I do think we still have a carryover of like 1950s-ish idea of one working parent, one stay-at-home parent. And um, that doesn't work anymore for those of us who like to live indoors or eat food. Uh, so yeah, we could probably transition away from that a little bit. Totally agree. So thank you very much, all of you. And one last thing, so we recorded this session and other session they we're gonna uh i should have said that in the beginning sorry uh <laughs> but uh we are planning to put it on youtube but we will speak with the uh, your guest speakers the guest speakers in order to see if you agree to be put on youtube or not or if there are some specific parts that you don't want um to be there so elia usually is our video editor and uh, he's not here today but he usually um, cuts the video and make it um, nicer so that also people that were not able to join the conversation, perhaps they can get some information out of it. So we will speak with you later uh, by email. We will reach out and ask you about permissions, okay? I don't remember saying anything career ending, right, guys? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think good. So. Bye, everyone. Thanks for having me. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye.